have a friend in Jesus that can and will and wants to help us if we'll turn to him. Proverbs chapter number 4 this evening. Proverbs chapter number 4. And um, I'm going to share some thoughts with you. Now, my, my key verse in this passage and the key thought that I want to share we'll find all the way down in verse 26. But we're going to kind of work our way to that uh, and then away from it. And you'll hopefully figure out what I'm talking about uh, in a little while. But we're going to start reading in verse 20. Proverbs chapter 4, verse number 20. You found your spot already? Say amen. amen. All right. Uh, well, at least one of you got a Bible with you and found it. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a froward mouth, and perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. The key verse again, and, and the, the thought for tonight. Verse 26 here. Ponder the path of thy feet. And let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Father God, we are thankful for the wisdom that you've given us in your word. Through your word and by your word. And oh, how we would be helped if we would pay close attention to, and that we would heed your word. What a blessing it would be to us in this world. What a blessing it would be to us in our soul and spirit. What an encouragement and a help it would be as we navigate through the trying times of life and the challenges that uh, we, we face each and every day. Father, I pray that you'd help us and help us to establish ourselves tonight on your word, and that our hearts might be fixed upon it, and that our, and that our minds and our eyes might be uh, consistently uh, faced and fixed toward the things that you tell us and the directions that you point us. And Father, might you give us knowledge and understanding and wisdom that we might be doers of your word tonight, and that we might get a blessing because of it in Jesus' name, amen. All right. Now, the book of Proverbs, the whole thing, is just an outstanding book of incredible wisdom and help uh, as we face life's challenges. We find in our text tonight a key thought, though, when it comes to getting the help that we need. Because I don't know if... I suspect that you have the same challenge that I do. It's easy to know it. It's a whole different matter to live it. There's a lot of distance between the head and the feet. Hmm. And it's not just because I'm a tall guy. <laughs> the knowing of it is the easy part. The doing of it is the hard part. And we get a lot of encouragement tonight and a lot of reason tonight from our text for us to live it and put it into practice. And so I would just want to step with you from verse 20 down into verse 26 and uh, kind of gu guide your thoughts if I can and uh, bring things out to you to hopefully bring this passage to life for you tonight. Notice he says, attend to my words. <laughs> Have you ever spoken to somebody and you knew that they were not listening to you? Okay. 
Of course, if you've raised kids, you know that's pretty obvious. That's, that's a challenge. But even in the adult life, there are people that you're talking to, and man, it's just, it's in the stratosphere as far as they're concerned. They are not paying any a mind to what you're saying. It happens to me most Sundays. Attend to my words, he says. Pay attention to what I'm saying. You know, some preachers get up here and they, they pound. I don't want to do it too loud. We've got microphones in the area. But they pound and slam and kick and jump and holler and do backflips and run around the pews and do all kinds of stuff. Why? To get people to focus in on what I'm saying. They tell jokes and, and you know, they're just a lively lot. Some of them. Some of them are just droning on. Right? So yeah, really hard to listen to those preachers. <clears throat> I know. Attend to my words. Pay attention to what I'm saying. This, is, th- this should not fall on deaf ears. Notice he says, incline thine ears unto my saying. Incline. That means to sit up or lean forward, or lean into, literally, what I'm saying. Lean in and listen good. Oh, how it would be helpful for students in class to lean in and listen good. Oh, what a benefit it would be for young people to lean in and listen good. Oh, what a difference it would make if congregations would lean in and listen good. But it's a challenge. But that's why God had to say it specifically. Pay attention to what I have to say so that you can reap the rewards and benefits and and have the blessings of of, of what I'm telling you. Do you know that every word that God spoke is valuable? Every word that God has given us in this book is valuable. And I... Just because it's recent and current and important, I'll just say this again. They, they found more of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's am- the amazing thing is, all the folks that have been saying for the last 30, 40, 50, 100, 2,000 years, oh, but it's changed and it's not the same and it's changed over time. And one guy told it to another guy and then another guy told it to another guy and now we don't have the Word of God anymore because it's changed. No, no, no. What they're digging up matches exactly with what we got. Because God said it. And the Bible says God's going to preserve it unto every generation. But if you say something enough, loud enough, long enough, repeated enough, you'll get some folks to believe it. But God says you need to sit up Incline your ears. Pay attention to what I have to say to you because what I'm saying is going to help you. You know, it it is not polite to say, I told you so, is it? Isn't that one of the worst things you like to hear from somebody? I told you. Did, Did I not tell you? I wonder if God's going to say, didn't I tell you? Didn't I? I I, I hate to have to say this, but I told you so. He says, my son, attend to my words and incline thine ear unto my sayings. Notice verse 21 there. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. Don't let them depart from your eyes. You know, one of the things... Yes, we have, and I'm thankful for it. The Word of God is very prolific prolific these days. I mean, how many copies of the Bible do you own? I probably could not tell you, and I'd have to go home and take inventory. But he says, keep it before your eyes. It doesn't do any good to keep it in the car. In your book bag, in your pocket, 
He wants it to keep it before your eyes. We need to be paying attention to this book at least once a day, and that is the bare minimum, bare minimum, that we need to be looking at this book and, and reading and studying this book because there's so, such a wealth of information here for us. You know, we have, it's challenging to live today, isn't it? I mean, there are problems on every side. There's people problems. There's financial problems. And, and then there's uh, worldly problems. I, there's problems all over. There's internal problems and external problems and mental problems and heart problems and physical problems. I mean, we got problems. But God gave us a book so that we could know how to address those problems. Whatever kind of problems they are, God has his word, and he says you need to keep your eyes uh, focused and fixed and, and, and constantly browsing and, and reading my book because I've got answers for you. Attend to my words. Incline thine ear. Don't let them depart from your eyes. And then notice, keep them in the midst of thine heart. Psalm 119.11 says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Thine word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. If you're not keeping it before your eyes, if you're not inclining your ears, if you're not paying attention to what God is saying, you're not going to have it in your heart, and you're going to have a difficult time not sinning against God. And friends, if you sin against me and you offend me, that's not going to hurt you a whole lot. But if you sin against God and offend God, you just cut your help off. You just offended the only one. I mean, yeah, I can come over and I can bring my truck and move boxes for you. Or I can come over and I can smile and nod and we can pray together. I mean, but my, my help is really peripheral. God's help is invaluable. And that's why we need to hide his word in our heart. That's why we need to incline to it and, and focus on it and pay attention to it. Because he has the help that we need. Notice with me in verse 22. He says of his word, For they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Their life and their health. That's a a sustenance, that's a, a, a survival need. That is something that we desperately need. You know, you think about this, um, Corey Ten Boom, you ever heard of her? They were helping Jewish folks when the Nazis were trying to kill them. She ended up in the concentration camps. The word of God was precious to them. They had to smuggle it in. And they would sit, huddle around, and they would hide it uh, in, in the, in the uh, cots and, uh, and, and keep it tucked in and hide it in private places so that they, it wouldn't get taken away from them. You know, one of the problems that you and I have today, it's, the Word of God is so prevalent, we think, oh, it's no big deal. And it just ends up getting left here and there, and it's not valuable. It's not precious to us like to, it has been in past generations where they only had handwritten copies. I got two Bibles look just like that. And I got a couple of dozen that look all kinds of other ways. I got electronic Bibles on my phone, on my computer. I mean, I, I, got, I got Bibles everywhere. But how many of them do I read? How many of them do I study? How many of them do I spend my time thinking about and focusing on? God's word, he says, will sustain my life and maintain my health. I wonder how many folks have, have failed for life, have stumbled in life because they weren't 
focused on God's Word. I wonder how many of our health problems have come because we haven't focused on God's Word. We're malnourished. You ever seen a malnourished person? Sometimes they put them on the TV and commercials to get you to malnourish your wallet. You think, oh, that poor young person. Some of them probably got more life-saving nourishment than we got. <clears throat> it's amazing to me. You go to Honduras, like I've been several times now, and you can stand on the street with a box of Bibles and in no time hand them out. It's taken us months to hand out a case of Bibles here. And it's not gone yet. The Word of God will sustain your life and maintain your health. Look at verse 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. You know why he says to, that, that we need to uh, let it not depart from your eyes in verse 21 and keep in the, in the midst of thine heart? Because out of the heart of the issues of life. Jesus, you know, they, they complained to Jesus because the disciples were picking uh, corn, picking grains of wheat and eating them uh, on the road there and on the way to, to his uh, meetings. Like, hey, they're, they're working on the Sabbath day. Man, you need to cut their hands off. You need, to, you need to really get on to them. And he said, don't you know it's not what you're putting in your mouth? It's what's coming out of your mouth from your heart. That's what defiles you. You know why our hearts so wicked and defiled? You know why we got such a problem in our day with sin that we do? Because we haven't been applying the salve of God's word to our hearts so that we could be pure there. And the heart is sick and desperately wicked and who can know it but God? And the very thing God says you need to put there to solve that problem, we pretty much ignore. preached last Wednesday night on how right thinking produces right living and how wrong thinking produces wrong living. Do you know why we have wrong living and so little right living? It's because we, we have stored and, and, and sowed and applied so little of God's word to our hearts and, and what you're seeing today what you're seeing in society is a symptom. What's a symptom of, preacher? It's a symptom of folks who have not applied God's word to their heart. And what we're seeing out there and what we're hearing out there is simply what's flowing out of the heart of man. Right or wrong, our thoughts lead to actions and our actions show us what's in our heart like I preached on Sunday morning we had our candles so oh preacher I'm saved I'm on my way to heaven uh, God's living in my heart the Lord Jesus Christ been received by me I got the Holy Spirit of God indwelling me but nobody can see your candles lit Why? Well, your light's what's flowing out of you. But if your globe's all nasty and dirty, nobody can see the light. You say, globe? Yeah, you know the old hurricane lamps that had the, the glass around them, and you'd put the light inside, and you'd put the glass down around it? Well, they'd get all sooted up. Our lives are all sooted up. So even if the light is on, we've got a bushel over it. We've got a basket over it. We've got uh, it guarded. Well, you know, there's just a couple things you don't talk about. Politics and religion. So we got to, mm, can't talk about that. Somebody might get offended. Well, it's time to start offending somebody. We've already been offending somebody, but it's time to offend somebody else. Because God's done tired of being offended at our lack of communication about Him. 
Look at verse 24. He said, put away from thee a froward mouth, and perverse lips put far from thee. <laughs> the word froward, one of the, one of the words, one of the synonyms for froward is perverse, FYI. But it means, what, what that froward there means is an unwillingness to comply. And then in the next part of that verse, perverse lips put far from thee. So we've got a froward mouth, one that, that, that doesn't want to comply, and we have perverse lips. And perverse means in, in, in that word, obstinate, contrary, or stubborn. You know what the problem is? We're full of pride. And we don't want to admit that God's right and we're wrong. We don't want to admit God knows what he's talking about and we don't. He said we need to put that kind of thoughts and, and that kind of ideas. And we need, we need to stop being froward with God. We need to stop being perverse and contrary and stubborn with God. been a few folks who have said well i know that's what you said preacher but i just want you to know i don't believe it and i don't agree with you and i'm just not going to do it that's forward and perverse by the way those definitions come from the 1828 webster's dictionary the same dictionary that was used or in the same in same time frame as the uh the king james text so the meanings are pretty close to what they meant when the translators did the work there. We have a perverse generation, the Bible says. A perverse and wicked generation. They're obstinate. I just don't want to do it, even though I know it's right. Verse 25 goes on to say, Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Don't be shifty-eyed. You ever talk to somebody that's shifty-eyed? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. They're constantly looking for something else to look at because they don't want to make eye contact. Because It's like this. When we were in Italy, and we, we, we landed in Italy, and we got taken to the, uh, to the hotel, when my wife and I were living there in the, in the, uh, in the Navy days, they took us to the hotel, dropped us off. It was culture shock all the way from the time we got off the plane till the time we, we, <laughs> till the time we got back on the plane to leave. <laughs> but one of the things they taught you, because you had to go to school to defeat the culture shock when you got there. The military said, okay, you're going to go to class. You got, I think it was a week, several days you had to get together and you had to sit with, and you know, they talked about you know, renting, and they talked about driving, and they talked about going out to eat, and they talked about what would offend them, and, and gestures. You know, here, you know what the American gestures are if somebody's mad at you, right? Going down the street, you don't even have to, you don't have to say anything. They can wave at you from the car window, and you know they're not happy with you. Well, they have those same things on the other side of the world, too. So they, they taught you all of that stuff. So if you saw, you know, and one of the things they, they said, if you're driving and there's an intersection, you've got the right of way, right? Now, generally in America, if you've got the right of way, you've got the right of way, but not in Italy. Because if they stick their nose out and you make eye contact with them, you just gave them permission to go first. Whether you remember you did or not. Whether you thought you did or not. I remember one time I was riding my motorcycle on my way to work one morning. And I'm on the cobblestone street part. And I'm going down through there and a car tucked its nose out between two villas with concrete blocks that were up. You know, you couldn't see nothing. So they stick their nose out and they turned left. Now I've got a face shield. I've got the whole helmet and everything on. They looked at me. They thought I looked at them, but I intentionally did not. And out they come. I'm on a motorcycle and it's cobblestone streets. I couldn't stop. 
It was a heavy bike, fortunately, and I stayed on, but their car got dented a little bit. Oh, they were mad at me. Oh, they were mad at me. Only English, only English, and off and gone I was. Didn't want them to get my license plate, you know, because then I might be in trouble. <sighs> Let thine eyes look right on, God says. Let thine eyes look right on. And thine eyelids look straight before thee. Don't be shifty eyed, don't lo- lack focus. Now let's get to our text, verse 26. Notice he says next, Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Ponder the path of thy feet. Ponder. To weigh in the mind. That's what that means, ponder. To weigh out in the mind. To to meditate on, to sit and consider thoughtfully, what, what way are you going? What, friends, what way are you going? Where, where, where are you headed? What direction are you going in? What, what direction is your life pointed in? You know, if I took out my bow and arrow tonight, and I pulled it back, and I released it, can I tell you the arrow would go that way, not that way? It wouldn't go over here, and it wouldn't go over there. It's going to go right over there. If I pulled out my gun tonight, and I shot my gun, it'd go over there. Not over there, or there, or there, or there. Now, I need to consider what's over there, and what I'm going to do damage to over there. But I need to get my eyes focused straight on. I can't be Googling around over here and over there and yonder. But I need to consider the course, the path of my feet. Where, if I go this way, where am I going to end up? Have you considered where you're going to end up yet? And yeah, I'm thinking about heaven and hell, but, but beyond that, more than that, Where are you going? Well, all roads lead to Rome. No, not in Italy even. Not even in Italy. Trust me, I tried that. You can get terribly lost in Italy trying to get to Rome just going any old direction. That is a fallacy. So God says you need to consider which way your feet are taking you and the path that you're walking on. And you need to really ponder that. In light of what God has said, what direction are you going? Ponder the path of thy feet. That is the track or the way. It even refers to a ditch. (laughs) Because you know how we get in a rut sometimes. Make sure your ruts go in the same direction God says we ought to go. Some of us get in a rut going this way. God wants us going that way. Some of us get in a rut going over this way. When God wants us to go that way. Ponder the path of thy feet. Why do we need to ponder the path of our feet? He said, let all thy ways be established. Psalm 119, verse 59, he says, I thought on my ways and turned my feet unto thy testimonies. God's word. We need to consider what God has said. Attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Don't let them, uh, let them not depart from mine eyes and keep them in the midst of thine heart for their life to those that find them. Health to their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee the froward mouth and the perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on and thy eyelids look straight before thee and then ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. Notice, turn not to the right hand, nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. You know, if you followed all of the advice from verse 20 down into verse 27, you'd probably still step in a pile somewhere because we're humans and we're sinful 
and God knows it. Even if God fenced us in and said there's only one tree not to touch, he knows we'd still mess it up. So he said here, remove thy foot from evil. He said when you get to taking a step and you go, ooh, that was kind of squishy. Remove it. Don't in pride say, well, that's just what... God knew that was going to happen. Well, God understands. Have you ever got into the van or into the vehicle? You probably don't drive a van. And you noticed <clears throat> somebody stepped in something this morning. <laughs> Y'all need to check your feet. No, you don't understand. I'm not leaving until y'all check your feet. We're not going anywhere until you get that, whatever it is, out of here. Right? Y'all know where I'm coming from? God says if you step in something, retract your foot. Pay attention. And if you're tuning in and you're not aware, we live on a farm. And when it was 12 kids at home, there was 14 pairs of shoes leaving the house through the dogs and the cats and the chickens and the guineas and, and everything else that was on the property at the time. And sometimes you step in it. And God knows. God knows, friends, that sometimes we step in it. And that's why he says we need to consider the path of our feet. And we need to not turn to the right hand nor to the left and remove our foot from evil. When we step in it, we need to get out of there. We easily take wrong steps as a human being. Psalm chapter 37 and 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Now I'm almost finished with the introduction, so just hold on a few more minutes. If we're following God's directions, if we're inclining our ears unto his sayings, if we're not departing, allowing them not to depart from our eyes and, and we're keeping them in the midst of our hearts, if we're following God's directions for our path, then our way will be pleasing to us and to him. You know, I've always kind of meditated and, and thought about that, that Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. And I've always thought, well, is that his way, God's way, or my way? You know what I've realized? Yes. It's his way. And my way. We'll both be happy if I just go the way he says I should go. You know, there are folks who say, well, am I, I'm afraid if I do what God says, I'll be miserable. Friend, can I tell you, 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 that is not even a concern. I promise you, if you go in the way that God directs you, you will never be happier. Your foot could land anywhere else on all of creation, doing anything else, and you will not be as happy as right exactly where God has for you if you'll follow his steps. So let's, let's, go, let's put this kind of in a, in a big picture kind of way. Early in this passage, and I'm talking about from verse 20 to 22, we're instructed to pay close attention to the Word of God, to God's instructions. Pay close attention to it. In verses 23, 4, and 5, we're encouraged to get the rain over our flesh. Because you know what? That's the problem. He says, keep thy heart. Notice it says, keep thy heart. Did you, did, you, did you understand that to keep thy heart is not something that God's going to do? It's something that I need to do? 
I can't keep your heart. I can't keep anybody else's heart. The truth of the matter, it's hard enough to keep my own heart, but you can't do anything about mine, and I can't do anything about yours, and and, and God's not even responsible for my heart. I am. We need to pay attention to what God says, and then with that information, say, you know what? I'm responsible for this thing right here. I'm the one that's supposed to pay attention to what God said and then follow the, the directions. And notice he says, keep thy heart with all diligence. In other words, this is not going to be a once and done thing. This is not going to be, I'll do it today and I'm good for a while. This is something I have to do consistently and constantly for the rest of life, no matter how old you get. I think of Eli in the Old Testament. If you're not familiar, he was was the priest, the high priest. The Bible says he has two wicked sons. Hophni and Phinehas would invite their girlfriends into the temple for extracurricular activities. I mean, I'm talking wicked. When people brought their offerings, they would just take whatever they wanted. They were wicked. Now, do you think Eli was always that way? No, I don't think so. I'm just saying this. we got to guard our hearts, and, and it, we don't get old enough to not have to do that anymore. you got to guard your heart as a young person. You have to guard your heart as a middle-aged person, and you need to guard your heart as an older person, and when you get to be aged, you're still going to have to guard your heart. We need to reign over our flesh. Keep thy heart. He says in verse 24, notice this, put away from thee a froward mouth. Hey, who's in charge of your mouth? You are. It's not my fault that you say things you're not supposed to say. I didn't make you say that, and you didn't make me say that. Notice in verse 25, let thine eyes. Do you realize you're responsible for where you let your eyes? Let thine eyes. You're responsible for that. You need to get a, 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 a rain in over our flesh. You need to get a grasp on your own flesh. Let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Notice, finally, we're told to consider with our mind the direction of our path. But you notice it starts with We need to pay attention to what God says. We need to pay attention to the words of God and the instructions of God and the ways of God. And then we need to take those instructions and we need to, with those, uh, control our own self. And then we need to direct ourself. Have you ever played with a remote control car? It takes a few minutes to figure out the controls of that thing. Somebody bought me one of those drones one time. It wasn't one of the really, really fancy, expensive ones, which is probably good because I've crashed it a few times. Do you know that takes a little work to figure out how to control that? Do you know what you got to do? You got to read the instructions. Attend to thine words. And then you got to figure out, okay, that one does this, and this one does that, and just like this. Incline thine ear, then get a grip, and then consider what we're going to do with this. It's amazing to me. You can take an electronic device, hand it to a child today, and they'll have it mastered in moments. but how many of us can control our flesh? 
How many of us got a good handle and grip on our eyes? How many of us are applying to our heart the instructions that God says and, and can control ourselves and say, I'm going this way? But that's what God tells us in this passage. Now, they say hindsight is supposed to be 2020, right? And I'm pretty sure my mom's was, but I'm not that good. Yeah, she could see out the back of her head. I'm convinced. <clears throat> she could still see out the back of her head. So if we start right here with what we've just learned, pay close attention to God's instructions. Reign in our flesh and control it. Consider with our minds the direction and really put some thought into where we're headed with this thing. And if hindsight's 2020, we can start from here and we can figure out where we're going and where we want to end up. Tonight we need to evaluate the path that we're on. If I continue to go the direction that I'm on, where am I going to end up? You no doubt have driven down the interstate if you're an adult and a driver. And at some point said, hmm, was that my exit back there? Now I've got to figure out how to get back there. And I hate it when the next exit's 25 miles the, the other direction. One time, a family member of mine was, was headed somewhere to visit other family members, and they ended up leaving the state. And it wasn't a short drive. They were just busy talking with the person riding with them, and they ended up in the next state. <laughs> oh, dear. So we'll start here, and let's consider just a couple of quick things tonight. Joshua chapter 1, verse number 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that's written therein. For then thou shalt have, make thy way prosperous. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. And then thou shalt have good success. Now would you agree with me tonight, church, that good success and prosperity is what we want? I don't know of anybody who says, no, 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 preacher. I want to fail. No, no, no. I like losing. I haven't met too many people. In fact, I'll just have to admit, I haven't met anybody who says, no, I'd rather lose than win. I mean, I've met people who would absolutely break arms, limbs, and whatever else just to win a volleyball game or a basketball game or a baseball game or a flag football game. This is not supposed to be tackle, friends. Good success is where we want to be. Is that right? That's where we want to be. Prosperous. Let me remind you tonight. Matthew 25. In fact, yeah, let's turn there. We're not going to spend much. I'm almost finished. I introduced and now I'm, now I'm closing. So it'll be all right. Matthew chapter 25. Another half an hour and we'll be home. I'm just teasing Matthew 25. Notice with me. We're going to just very briefly look at Matthew 25, verses 19 to 30. All right? And I'm not going to read this whole thing. I just want you to see where this is at. All right? Here, the Lord is reckoning with people that he's given the talents to. This is the parable of the, the talents. He gave one five, he gave one two, he gave one one. Remember, the guy with five came back with ten. The guy with two came back with four. The guy with one came back with one and said, hey, I knew what kind of guy you were, and so I buried it, and it's over there if you want it. Then 
Do you remember what he said to the one with five and the one with two? Do you remember what he said? Well done. His Lord said unto him, verse 21, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou in the joy of thy Lord. Isn't that where we want to be? That's where I want to be. Right? In verse 23, the same words there. The guy that had two brought two back, and guess what? He said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And then you get to a guy with only one that did nothing except buried in the ground. And he says, in verse number 28, Take therefore the talent from him, and give it to him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and to he that uh, shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken even that which he hath. And cast ye that unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I'm just saying we need to consider the path and ponder the path of our feet. Are we on a path that's productive and profitable? Are we controlling because of what we know from God's Word? Are, have we got a good reign and control over our members and our thoughts and our ideas and our heart and, and, and our flesh? Or are we just kind of wandering aimlessly through life? I'll get to that when I have time, maybe. I want you to consider another passage here from verse 31 down to verse 46. And again, we're not going to read this whole passage. You can read it later. But here, Jesus is coming back again as, I, as I'm looking forward to him coming back. And it says in verse 32... Uh, that the all nations will be gathered, verse uh, 32, the ha last half, and he shall separate them one from another as shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats shall uh, be set on the left hand. Then shall the king say unto them that are on the right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, enter ye in, uh, uh, the kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world. And he goes through the spiel. Come on in. Sheep, you did good. And to the goats, he said, depart from me. I never knew you. We want to be with the sheep, right? That's, that's where we want to be. I want to be with the sheep. I want to be with the well dones. Well, guess what? We have to ponder the path of our feet. We have to consider what God has said and apply it to our lives. If we're going to finish right, if we're going to finish well, if we're going to end up in the place where we want to end up, we've got to take Proverbs chapter 4 and we've got to understand that there are some things that we have got to do with that. And we can't blow it off. Say somebody else will take care of it. No, no, no. Ponder the path of Thy feet. By the way, it's not my responsibility to ponder the path of your feet. If you end up in the wrong place, it won't be my fault. And if I end up in the wrong place, it won't be your fault. One more passage and we'll quit. Turn with me to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel, Old Testament, after Psalms and Proverbs, headed on into the New Testament. Ezekiel chapter 18. And I want to point out verse, just two verses here, and I just want to summarize them real quick, because I don't know if you've noticed, but we, we looked at Proverbs chapter 4, and that pretty much lined up with what Jesus said in Matthew. And that pretty much lined up with what David wrote in the book of Psalms. You know, God doesn't just say things one time. 
he continually and repeatedly warns us and lets us know this is, listen, this is the way it is. And he says it in multiple ways at multiple times so that multiple people can get a hold of this and understand it. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, verse 27, again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness, he that he hath committed, and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. Who shall save his soul alive? He shall. Verse 28, because he considereth, that's the same as pondereth, by the way, and turneth, that's the same as we need to control our own actions. He turneth away from all his transgressions that he hath committed. He shall surely live. He shall not die. You know what he did? He changed where he was going. He changed the path that he was on. Why? Because he considered what God said. He considered. He committed. Let me, let me summarize this passage this way. We need to consider our path just like this man did. We need to change our minds just like this guy did. And then we need to commit to doing right just like this guy did. Because he saved himself. He, he avoided the tragedy that was ahead because he pondered the path of his feet and said, I'm not, I'm not looking forward to, to finishing this course out. I need to change directions. Easy. Three steps. Consider your path, change your mind, and commit to what's right. Easy. We're all on target now, right? Well, none of us are going to... Fa- no, it's this, it sounds easy. The truth of the matter is, it's not difficult, it's not complicated, it's just hard. Because you've got flesh and so do I. Yeah, and let's not forget our pride. But the reality is, that's why he said that we need to keep God's word in our heart. That's why he said we need to keep it before our eyes. Because he knows, and he said, when, when you do step in it, <laughs> pick up your foot and put it down somewhere else. I don't know about you, but I've put my foot down in it a couple of times in my life. All right, all right, all right. I put my foot in it a couple of times this week. I've probably stepped in something at least once or twice today. Because, yeah, that's, that's what we need to do. But we need to be persistent in doing it. I don't know about you, but I think we need to pray. And I think we need to talk to the Lord. We need to ponder the path of our feet and decide where am I going? Where do I want to go? Where do I want to end up? 